Our scripture lesson this morning is our two short verses, first from Ecclesiastes 3.1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. And Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Phyllis. All right. So, we're going to try this. As most of you probably noticed, I'm wearing this shirt that Jordan and the girls got me, and it says Grandpa, like a grandpa, only grumpier. And so, that's kind of kind of what they always say. Why are you always so grumpy, Grandpa? So, just kind of how it is. I said, well, you know, this would be a good shirt to go with my message. So, whoa, wow, that's loud. A class of geography students, after traveling around the world by books, were asked to list what they considered the seven wonders of the world. You know, it was a hard decision. And they were thinking about it. But, you know, speaking of lists, I got one for you. Who can remember back in the mid-70s, McDonald's came out with a little jingle for their Big Mac? Anybody remember that one? Uh -huh. How's it going? Two all beef, that is special sauce, lettuce, two sprinkles, onion, sesame seed, bun. Look at that. Oh, and I forgot. Move the slides again. Yeah, okay. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, and onions on a sesame seed bun. Seven ingredients, just like the seven wonders. <clears throat> well, speaking of lists, though, there's another list that the Bible has for us. Anybody know what those that list is? About the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Do we know those? Can we repeat them off just as good as we can repeat off that jingle from McDonald's? Big Mac? Some of us can. I know I can. I know a few of them, but not all of them. And here's another little one to go with that. We got the, when, ten, when Moses, what was that show called? With the with the Ten Commandments, and Moses went up and got them. And then we have the little cartoon, and I'm sorry I can't read it from here. Let me turn this just a touch. But it kind of goes along with McDonald's. It says, over, it's a miracle. Over 5,000 served. He thinks the sign is a bit much. <laughs> Trying to do a little bit of fun. And both of those lists were made, were to think, make us think about being hungry or when we need to seek God's help. But let's get back to the list of seven wonders. Yeah, it was a hard decision, but things like the Taj Mahal, the Great Pyramids, the Redeemer, the Great Wall of China, were getting a lot of votes. But the teacher noticed a young girl sitting quietly. She hadn't entered into the discussion. She asked, are you having trouble? And the girl said, I couldn't make up my mind because there are so many. Well, tell us what you have. So she stood to her feet and read from her paper. I think the seven wonders of the world are touch, taste, to see, and to hear, and then to run, to 
to laugh, and to love. Oh boy, she was tuned in a different channel, and she was sharing wonders that are indeed greater than any marvels that we have created, because all those ones that we have are created by man. And her wonders come from God. None of them would be anything without the gifts of God that enabled us to wonder them and enjoy them. She was listing wonders not limited to one place in the geography of the world, but those wonders that God has given to those made in this image over the world. Her seven wonders are more wonderful because they are not just in one place, but every place. I don't know what the teacher's response was to her answer, but God's response is surely a hearty and heavenly amen. This is God's description of the ideal life for his people. It is a picture of just how good it can be when he is blessed by his people. We want to focus on just a few of the details. God says his idea of a perfect city is one where the city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. In Zechariah chapter 8, verses 19, he says the fast will be changed and the festivals will become glad and joyful occasions. Here's another little fun slide for you. Hopefully everybody can read them, I don't know. But. And God sorted the lights from the darts. And, okay, you say if we follow Jesus Christ, we may be persecuted. And we may die. Isn't there a witness protection program for us? Just a little something. But there is something about that verse that gives us sneaking suspicion that God's love is fun and his love and his people to have fun. There seems, it seems to be a little too lighthearted, but I hope to show that fun is fundamental to God's nature and his plan for us. The subject is so vast in scripture that the hardest part is to figure out how to limit it. The entire message could be devoted to just quoting Bible verses. And if you want to see what kind of Bible verses there are, just pull it up and they just go on and on. But there are verses on gladness, delight, joy, and feasting. It is so overwhelming with the number of texts dealing with the feelings of having fun that some of them get put on church signs. And I don't know how many of them you can see, but there are several on there that are pretty good. We also have God's acknowledgement that a playfulness we see in the animal kingdom is not by accident. The playfulness of God's animals makes us enjoy the zoos, nature films, and even more, our pets. It's built into the animal kingdom by God. It is part of his plan that man should enjoy the playfulness of animals and have them as pets. And enter into fun to play with them. We do not have time to pursue this we are just talking, taking a little peek. A peek that tells us why we enjoy our pets. And it, it's because God made them to be playful. In Psalms 104.26, the psalmist is describing a vast creation. And then he comes to the sea, teeming with creatures. We went to this, we went to Sea World and we went to go to Texas for Roderick's graduation from basic training and 
got to see all the fish swimming around and things like that. It was, it was pretty neat. But we could see how man could build great buildings, put in these great bodies of water for these fish and, the, and other animals, and for them to frolic in and give people an enjoyable entertainment. The Bible says the oceans are God's playground for these same cre for these same creatures. The only reason they can be trained to play games and to do tricks for our entertainment is because God made them this with this capacity to have fun and to play. God delights in his creations. And some of them may have no other purpose than to delight the creator. God has fun with his creations. And the reason we are to respect and conserve it is because God, because it is God's, and it gives pleasure to God and us. Even if we don't have the verses to say so, it would be a logical assumption that if God enjoys the playfulness of the animal's kingdom, he must also enjoy the playfulness of man. And here's a few more little church signs for you to look at while I'm trying to read. But the one I like the best up there in that corner is, there are some questions, what there are some questions that, and that can, can't be answered by Google. That, that's definitely one of Ginger's things. Well, you want to know what it is? Just Google it. But we do have the texts that illustrate this reality. In Isaiah 11, we get another one of God's descriptions as an ideal earthly environment. Note how children will be able to play with the animals in the animal kingdom. And not just in our present day domestic animals, but even in the animals that are dangerous. The wolves will live with lambs, the leopards will lie down with goats, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of a cobra. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In other words, where God is fully known, there is, pl there is play without pain. It is joy and pleasure. And all that God has made works together in harmony. And evil is absent completely. God anticipates this future idea with, some, with the same pleasure we anticipate that family adventure that we're going to have fun on. We all kind of remember how those go sometimes. We anticipate fun, but eh, maybe not always. You want your children to have fun, and God wants the same for his children. Playfulness is a part of godliness, but we seldom see the biblical picture of it. Because we lack this biblical foundation, we sometimes feel guilty when we engage in play. It's not all bad, for we need to keep in mind we are dealing with a paradox. There is another side to play that is dangerous and destructive, like any other value, when it comes to become an idol. It can become a curse. We need to keep a balance so that we don't lose God's best because we abuse playfulness. But on the other hand, some Christians go a little, go the other way. And a quote from Paul, set your affections on things above and not of things of this earth. And use this as a basis 
for rejecting the enjoyment of earthly play. In reality, we set our affections on other things above, on other things above. We see clearly in the nature of God which enables us to wisely choose what is consistent with that nature. When we have set our affections on things above, we will come to know that he who is the light and the life and the love also has affections for the things below. God delights in the th same things we do. The playfulness of animals, the fun of children, the festivities of adults. Celebrating is one of the ways that men can praise God. In 2 Samuel 6.5, David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with, their, with all their might before the Lord, with song, with harp, with lyre, tambourine, and cymbal. The ark of God has been returned and they were celebrating. When the prodigal son returned, there was also celebrating. When the prodigal son returned, there was also a celebration with song, dance, and feasting. Even the angels of heaven get into the mood and rejoice when we repent of our sin. The point is, there is fun in victory. There is a feeling we ought to be celebrating, singing, and having pleasure when God blesses and when God delights in our feeling this way. Fun is a part of the total worship experience. Here's another little one. I don't know if you can read it again, but let me share it with you. Here's your order, sir. A thousand business cards saying, Simon the fisherman. Later in the day, Jesus comes to Simon. Simon, from now on, you shall be called Peter. <laughs> Over the next few weeks, Jesus appeared to be to his disciples, many other, and many other witnesses. Then he ascended into heaven. Where? Where? I can't see him. He has ascension deficit syndrome. <laughs> well, fun is a total part of worship and is part of experience. And because this is so, we need not fear that heaven will ever be boring. With, for with eternal worship, there will also be eternal fun. Proverbs 8, 30, and 31 is a text on positive play that we look at. It is again in the context of God's creating the wonders of the world. Then I was at his side. I was filled with delight, daily playing before him, the whole time, rejoicing in his whole world, delighting in mankind. The picture is one we too seldom considered. God had fun creating the world. The sun and the angels all enjoyed it as well. There's another one I'll look for you guys. It was like a great celebration. A day of play as all of heaven entered into the light of watching. God set up the largest playground ever. It is a picture of children watching with the light as the circus is set up. All the preparations are made for a great time of fun. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached his great message that won 3,000 to Christ. And he quoted David as referring to Christ and his resurrection. He says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. 
my body will also live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known the paths of life. You will fill me with joy with your presence. The word for joy is a word for which we, in our English language, get the word euphoria. It covers all the emotions we refer to, like gladness, cheerfulness, happiness, delight, and joy. This tells us that God's plan was for Jesus to experience these emotions forever in his presence. Jesus knew how to enjoy life and to enjoy children playing. He could have had pleasures. He could have pleasures at the parties he attended, and he could add to the delight of others, just like he did at the wedding in Cana. It's clear that God made man the same way. He made the creatures of the field and the sea. He made them with the capacity to have fun and to play so they could enjoy the good things of life. It is a universal feeling this feeling of well-being called euphoria. All efforts used fun, all, all evangelism efforts use fun in the fundamentals and thinking about fun. How many church camp ministries can you think of that would survive if it wasn't fun? Take away the swimming, the boating, the ball games, the ping pong, the fights, the other sports. Take away all the fun and see how the people will stay away in droves. You couldn't pay kids to come to camp where fun is not fundamental. Every youth group and organization in the world knows this. If there is no plan for fun, you can forget planning anything else. It is not just kids who need it, but us adults as well. Pardon me. Lost my spot. The reason we enjoy musical groups also is because it's fun. We like listening to music. It's fun to be uplifted. If Christianity isn't fun, it's not pleasing to us or to God. We too often think of fun and play as a secular side of life. It's good to take a break until we need to get back to the more important things, the serious stuff. This concept is too bad because it leads Christians not to take fun seriously. They do not see it as a vital part of their spirituality. The key value for which they can praise, we need to see is that fun is fundamental in all, in our relationships of life, with our animals, with our friends, with our family groups, all kinds of things, and even God. Why did Jesus say, become as a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. We usually hear it because children are so innocent and so full of simple faith. It is no doubt a part of it. But what about the ch child's playfulness? That, what is ch I, that is what childhood is. It's a time of life where we learn to play. That is what childhood is. Is supposed to be. We learn to play. COVID has kind of put a little bit of damper on that for a lot of kids. They don't get that same play on this. So did Jesus ever play? We don't ever really think about that. As Jesus was growing up as a little boy, we think more about as he become started on his mission. All we know for sure is that he was a growing boy and he would have had fun. 
It's inconceivable to think that Jesus didn't play and have fun with children on earth. We are told that children learn to play is vital in their development of their identity. They do not learn to enjoy and play. They will become too serious as adults. Some do skip childhood and never learn to play. And this leads them to be people that are too serious and not enjoy life. On the other hand, if it's too much play, they're never taught that life is more than a game. You know the old saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Or another old way to say it is, all work and no play is not good for the soul. Psychiatrists will tell you that there are many common clients that come in and do nothing but play. They lack the pleasure to work in achieving goals. They eventually become depressed and lack the meaning of life. Play must be balanced with purpose, pleasing to God, or it becomes a burden. When God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, pleasure of playing and eating, but also get, he, he also gave them work of keeping the garden. Extremes of being workaholics, which I know I still am. I work more than I'm at home, that's for sure. Or just playing to be both con okay. or just playing will be contrary to God's will. Work and play have to be in a balance to have happy life. Dwight D. Eisenhower said to the students of Columbia University, where he became the president in 1948, have fun. I mean it. A day that goes by without you having had some fun is a day that you don't enjoy life. It is not only unnecessary, but it's unchristian. In relationship to our message, though, we can say any statement was biblically accurate. For the Bible clearly teaches that we can never be all that God made us to be without having some fun. For fun is fundamental. But keep in mind that it is fun to be a child of God. It is fun to be saved and to be forgiven. It is fun to be sanctified and to grow in the knowledge of God. It is fun to be in Christian service. There is joy in serving Jesus. Fun is a broad concept that takes in many aspects of life that are pleasing to God. God is fun-loving God, and we need to take fun seriously and make it a vital part of our Christian life. And be praising God for it continually. For fun is fundamental. Amen.